Hello and welcome to the webinar on breeding efforts and cover crop choices for improved organic dry bean production systems in Michigan by Aaron Hill and Jim Heilig of Michigan State University. My name is Alice Formiga and I'm the webinar coordinator for eOrganic. eOrganic is the organic agriculture community of practice with eExtension. You can find all of our published articles, videos, and our many upcoming and recorded webinars on organic farming and research topics on our website at extension.org slash organic underscore production. So we are very excited today to be um, hosting Aaron Hill and Jim Heilig as our speakers. Both Aaron and Jim are PhD students at Michigan State University in the Department of Plant, Soil, and Microbial Sciences. Jim's research focuses on the genetics and enhancement of biological nitrogen fixation. And Aaron's research focuses on weed ecology and management in conventional and organic dry bean production systems. Well, thank you, Alice, for the introduction. And thank you to all of you who are joining us today. Um, as she mentioned, we are going to talk about our breeding efforts and cover crop choices for improved organic dry bean production systems here in Michigan. And this project has been going on for about three years. It was funded by the USDA NEPA Organic Agriculture Research and Extension Initiative. And we've had several collaborators here that Jim and I have worked with at Michigan State University, including Jim Kelly, Karen Renner, Dan Rossman, and Christy Sprague. So with that, I think Jim is going to give us an outline and start our introduction today. Thank you, Erin. Um, today we're going to talk about a few things related to organic driving production. And here's just an outline of the, some of the topics we'll, we'll, we'll cover. Um, we'll go through a brief introduction on organic driving, or driving production in general in the United States and in Michigan, and then specifically the growing conditions in Michigan. Muted. I'll talk a little bit about our dry breeding efforts here at, at Michigan State University, specifically with our selection for proving, uh, improving nitrogen fixation in dry beans. And then I'll turn it back over to Aaron, who will talk about the cover crop influences of dry beans, specifically relating to nitrogen availability, weed pressure, and uh, dry bean populations. Dry beans are grown over a broad area in the United States. However, as you can see by this, this USDA slide uh, map, they are largely restricted to the northern areas of the country, and starting with Michigan in the east and going west. Uh, production in the, the east tends to be rain-fed where we have more uh, irrigated conditions out in the west. Uh, seed production is also greater in the west than in the east. Specifically for Michigan, our, re our bean production region is what we call here in Michigan the Thumb and the Saginaw Valley. And you can see that general area is circled. Here on County is at the tip of the Thumb and the that's where the production is the highest and it extends west into Montcalm County where there's more irrigated systems. We grow multiple dry bean market, market classes in Michigan. However, uh, the biggest market classes are uh, dry beans, or dry beans, yes, black beans, and navy beans, uh, which are highlighted there. But there is a smaller amount of, of market classes, such as kidneys and pintos. So specifically looking at some of the, the numbers, in, organi in, Michi in organic production, Michigan accounts for over 40% of the organic dry bean production in the United States. And you can see the numbers there from the 2008 uh, USDA uh, website. Our specific pr production, as far as the, the average production in Michigan, is about 1,900 weight to the acre. When we say 100 weight, that's 100 pounds to the acre, so 1,900 pounds to the acre. And that includes all dry bean market classes. So now I will turn it over to Erin, who's going to tell a little bit more about the specific conditions in Michigan. Okay, thank you, Jim. So, so to look uh, now closer at the Michigan growing conditions, we just wanted to give you an idea compared to maybe the areas where you are, what what we have here. So we're looking at a hardiness zone ranging from five to six and we're really right in between those zones in this uh, area highlighted on the map in the dry bean growing region. Uh, in Michigan our annual precipitation is usually around 30 inches per year and uh, during the dry bean growing season from June to October we usually get a, a little over half of that around 16 inches. 
Our soils here are of the order alpha sols, and they range from a sandy clay loam to a clay loam. And our organic matters are ranging from 1 to 3 percent. So now moving on to look at some of our common uh, dry bean production practices for Michigan. Uh, we're usually planting our dry beans during the month of June. For organic growers, it's usually mid to maybe later June. And we're planting anywhere from 15 inch rows to 30 inch rows. Uh, the harvest of these beans depends definitely on the uh, maturity of the bean variety that was chosen, but it usually ranges from late September into early November. And uh, direct harvest is uh, probably the most common method of harvest here in Michigan now as opposed to pulling and windrowing the beans. Uh, over 90% of our dry bean production in Michigan is rain fed, as I think Jim mentioned. And I thought, since we will be talking a lot about nitrogen today, it's important to mention that uh, conventional producers are applying uh, usually 40 pounds or more of nitrogen per acre um, at the time of planting to help those beans. So I wanted to look at some of the common pests that we have in Michigan just to give you an idea of what it's like here. So first, starting out with weeds, we have a broad spectrum of weeds. Uh, several different annual grass species, common lamb's quarters and common ragweed, several pigweed species, uh, velvet leaf and jimson weed, and some of our most difficult perennial weed species to deal with are perennial south thistle and Canada thistle. And with regard to managing these weeds um, organically, uh, most of the growers here are using a rotary hoe, either a single rotary hoe or a double rotary hoe as we have pictured here. And then they're following that with some between row cultivation until the beans uh, close canopy are, are too large to mechanically cultivate. Now looking at some of our most common insect pests that we've seen, especially over the last three years, um, we usually see some leaf hoppers, uh, occasionally Mexican bean beetle, and then sometimes also Japanese beetle. And finally, with re regard to issues with soy or excuse me, issues with dry beans, uh, some of our most common bean diseases are anthracnose, rust, root rot, common bacterial blight, bean common mosaic virus, and then white mold. And so now I'm going to turn it back over to Jim to talk a little bit about his research and the breeding portion. Thanks, Aaron. Um, so these specific pests that, that beans address, I, I wanted to just take a minute to talk about how bean breeders are able to address some of these problems and, and uh, develop cultivars that might be varieties that are resistant to them. And I don't have control of the... Okay, let me... Uh, yeah, I was wondering if you still couldn't do it. Okay, try clicking on the screen again. Okay, so here's just a look at, uh, uh, now we go too far fast, too far ahead. Uh, here's a look at some of the, the results that we've had here at Michigan State University. Uh, one of the biggest, one of our, a disease that can cause considerable damage is anthracnose, and you can see here, these, this picture is actually of a field, two fields side by side, and the variety on the left, condor, is a black bean, and it is resistant to anthracnose, but in the neighboring field, right next door touching it, uh, the Vista navy bean is susceptible, and you can see a picture of the damage that anthracnose does to the seed, especially on the white beans, it's very visible. And then also, one of the other problems is common bacterial blight. And here we have a black bean on the left, which is extremely resistant, uh, has very little damage from the bacterial blight. But the, the heirloom, quote unquote, seafarer, which is a navy bean on the right, is considerably uh, susceptible to bacterial blight. So through our breeding efforts, we've been able to bring in resistance from other areas, other varieties of beans into market classes in Michigan. So we had started looking a few years ago at 
organic production since there had been some people asking questions and more interest in growing beans organically. And we looked at all mar uh, major market classes grown in Michigan and we conducted a research by planting variety trials in side-by-side -side plots, organic and conventional. And we found that consistently the organic fields lo yielded 20% lower than the organic uh, I'm sorry, they're conventionally grown counterparts. The large seeded beans, the kidney, kidney and cranberry specifically, uh, yielded the lowest with the small and medium seeded beans such as blacks and navies, pintos, great northerns, etc. had considerably higher yields. Both systems had similar stresses. They were planted side by side so they had the same insect pressure, the same precipitation and the same disease pressure. So the biggest difference that we found though was the difference of the management of the soil and specifically the nutrient levels in the soil. So we took our research from looking at all of those different beans and tried to focus specifically on navies and black beans since they are the most important market classes in Michigan. So since we had identified that nitrogen or soil nutrition might have been one of the biggest differences between the two systems, we decided to investigate more closely biological nitrogen fixation, or I'll probably say BNF through much of the presentation. Uh, dry beans, like many legumes, are able to actually fix their own nitrogen from the atmosphere. Remember, the atmosphere is made up of over three quarters nitrogen, and they form this association with rhizobia in their roots, where they form nodules, and they are, allowed, they are able to fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. Um, they are considered poor fixers, though. We look at a, a similar crop, soybeans. Soybeans are able to get most of their nitrogen needs from the atmosphere, whereas dry beans, as Aaron mentioned, people are still providing nitrogen because, at planting because they just aren't able to get all that they need. We do know from previous research of others that there, there is this variability within dry beans, and some are better at doing it, fixing nitrogen than others, and there's also an interaction with the rhizobia that's in the soil. We, as breeders, can use this, this variation to develop varieties that are better able to fix nitrogen. So how do we measure differences in, in biological nitrogen fixation or BNF? Uh, the current most popular method is called the natural abundance method and we analyze the 15N in plant tissue and seed and what, we'll talk about what 15N is in, in a moment um, but we compare the 15N content of a non-nodulating bean and you can see the picture on the left there that little yellow thing as a variety uh, variety called R99, which we work with, it's a navy that does not have the ability to nodulate. And you can see, compared to its counterparts in the back, which are fixing nitrogen, um, it is not able to fix nitrogen. So we can use that variety as a, as a test to go ahead and measure these differences in 15N. Um, nitrogen 15 is a naturally occurring stable isotope of nitrogen. It has an extra neutron, so it has a greater atomic weight. But it's very rare in the atmosphere or on the planet in general. And uh, it tends to accumulate in organic matter. The microbes tend to have a little a preference for nitrogen-15, so the level in the soil and the organic matter will be elevated over what is in the atmosphere. That can be measured with appropriate equipment, and we use the Stable Life Isotope facility at UC Davis to, for, our, for our, our work. So here's just a graphic of kind of, because sometimes the concepts can be a little confusing, and it take, took me a while to, to get a grasp on it as well. But the, the little red dots represent the 15N, and the green dots represent 14N. And on the left here, we have a non-fixing bean plant, and its N15 concentration is similar to what's found in the soil. The plant on the right is fixing nitrogen, and with those nodules, is pulling the, the nitrogen from the atmosphere, which has a lower concentration of, of 15N, so it has a diluted amount of N15. We can use those differences to measure then how much of that nitrogen in that plant comes from the atmosphere. So we went and invest to investigate this um, more closely. We looked at 18 varieties of black beans and 18 varieties of navy beans uh, Incl uh, including advanced breeding lines and commercial checks. Some of the black beans we looked at were Zorro and Black Velvet. Uh, navy beans included Metalus and Vista. And then, of course, we included our non-nodulating R99, which was actually derived from the Navy variety Bunsi. So each year, as we do, this was over the course of three years, we updated the lines in our, in our, in our trial based on what was coming from the standard trial of the, of the main breeding program here at Michigan State. Uh, and we followed organic practices for weed control, fertility, insect control, and all of those things. Seed was treated with rhizobia at planting. In Michigan, we're lucky that most of the soils actually have sufficient rhizobia in them. However, there's been some evidence that inoculating 
improves the uh, association, and we wanted to make sure that there was rhizobia there. At harvest, we measured the 15N of the seeds to determine, as I said, the percent of nitrogen derived from the atmosphere. Um, so here's a, a slide um, that shows some of the, I'm going to go through a couple slides that just show our, uh, some of the results that we've, we've had. And, and you can see a couple trends by looking at this slide. This is uh, the yield results from our 2011 Tuscola County site. And you'll see that there's actually quite, and these bars, the blue represents the soil that's derived from the soil. And then the, the red or the orange represents what's derived from the atmosphere. And you can see that the amount of nitrogen derived from the atmosphere is actually not a very, very significant proportion of what the nitrogen that plants have. And we have R99 over here at the, on the far right. It was the lowest yielding variety, which you might, ex might expect. But another thing to note is that the black beans tend to be higher yielding than the navy beans. And this is a trend that we kind of see throughout our work is that the navies do tend to be a little less competitive, especially compared to the to the, uh, the black beans, or the, the colored seeded. And the, remember, this is a selection of the 18, so there were originally 18 navy and 18 black. So um, there's a bunch in the middle that I don't, don't have here because they're not as perhaps interesting, but just to keep that in mind, that the navies do tend to fall to the bottom of the list. In 2011, we also had a site at Frankenmuth, and the soil was considerably uh, more compacted, lower nutrients, and it also was drier than the other site, which is about 30 miles away. And you can see the yields were actually lower here at this site. However, there's still considerable nitrogen coming from the soil, whereas the nitrogen from the atmosphere is a, is a smaller amount. And I just have the, the yields here from a couple of our, of our other sites, and you can see the trend kind of more or less holds. So some of the observations that we can, we can take away from the, our work on the organic evaluation of these navies and blacks is that their performance is quite variable year to year. There, there's quite a bit of variability from specifically rainfall. 2012 was a dry year compared to the others. Um, and also that navy beans do tend to yield lower than black beans. And also that nitrogen derived from the atmosphere is not a very significant portion of the, uh, of the nitrogen that the plants take in. So we decided to go look at a little more closely at what actually was going on and investigate the genetics of biological nitrogen fixation. And we know from previous researchers that there is considerable variability for plants to fix nitrogen, for bean plants specifically. And the land race Pueblo 152, which was discovered in Pueblo, Mexico, has been identified as a high fixer. Uh, in Michigan, though, it's a very late maturing bean. It starts flowering at the end of August and September, so it's not very well adapted to production in Michigan. We cross that bean with the very well adapted Zorro, which is a very efficient plant of, of a commercial variety here in Michigan. And we developed 125 recombinant and bred lines, or what we call them. Um, and each one of these lines can be looked at like as a variety. And these allow us to then study the inheritance of traits from those two parents. And remember, we're specifically looking at the biological nitrogen fixation coming from the Puebla. So here I have a graph of the, some of the yield results, and it's similar to the graphs we looked at. The, the red or orange is the nitrogen derived from the atmosphere, and the blue is the nitrogen derived from the soil. And I have circled in red both the parent Zorro and Puebla. And it might looks a little suspicious because you would expect Puebla to have a higher level of nitrogen fixed from the soil because, as I said, we identified it as a good fixer. But with it being so poorly adapted to Michigan, there's some factors that kind of uh, kind of cloud perhaps its abilities for at nitrogen fixation, um, such as its lateness. It doesn't actually set seed very well, so et cetera. Um, some of the lines, though, are quite good at fixing nitrogen. You have like this B11603, and this other one right here, B11551, or B11569, that are getting almost half of their nitrogen from the atmosphere. And they're still competitive as far as yield, so we that's, that's, a, that's a good thing. However, on the other hand, we have some others over here, like B11594 and B11570, which get very little nitrogen from the atmosphere, or this Navy Vista, or the Nonad Check, which gets 
no nitrogen from the atmosphere. But another interesting thing to point out, maybe as I was pointing out here, you're noticing that these four lines or these five lines are yield very similarly, the B11594, B11570, B11614, um, but they're getting their nitrogen from very different areas. And so that leads us to think, suspect that there's definitely different components of yield and nitrogen fixation is important, but these beans are perhaps getting, are more better able to scavenge nitrogen from the soil or, uh, or some other some other characteristic that's giving them a uh, little better advantage on the yield. So we wanted to look a little more closely specifically at what was going on. And here is a, a map of what we a genetic map looking at the chromosomes or the gen, the genetics of the of the so the traits that we were we were looking at. And we can see that nitrogen traits tend to group in the in the genome with agronomic traits that are also associated with yield. We have harvest index associating with nitrogen and biomass, and that might explain a bean that is able to mobilize resources from the tissue into the seed uh, with, you know, have an enhanced yield perhaps. And here, this one's quite, quite obvious. We have two seal, seed yield, uh, nitrogen yield uh, regions in the genome associated with seed nitrogen in the seed. And I just have a couple more chromosomes. This gets a little confusing. There's a lot going on here, but just again, it further shows specifically chromosomes one and chromosome eight. We have a lot of so these traits localizing together within the genome. So some of the takeaway points that we can make from the from our look at the genetics of BNF is that there is genetic variability within the population we have, which is good because we can use some of those lines to breed into uh, advanced breeding lines to improve nitrogen fixation in a more modern, more adapted uh, genotype or variety. Some of the rills do derive a substantial portion of their nitrogen from the atmosphere, and the biological nitrogen fixation characteristics associate in the genome with yield traits. Um, partitioning, like I said, the ability to mobilize resources from vegetative tissue to seeds plays an important role in nitrogen use efficiency. And I will go ahead and turn it back over to Erin, and she's going to tell us about her work with uh, cover crops. Thank you, Jim. Let's see if I, I, I first need to apologize because I realized that I sent a uh, older version of this PowerPoint, so that may have tripped Jim up a little bit. So uh, thank you for bearing with us. Um, now I'm going to talk about um, our portion of the uh, uh, dry bean project, <coughs> excuse me, where we looked at the influence of cover crops uh, in an organic system. So we were really interested in cover crops um, from the standpoint of, uh, as Jim just talked about, nitrogen. How do the cover crops influence the nitrogen that's available in the soil to the dry beans since they aren't as efficient fixers as soybeans say? Uh, how do cover crops influence weed dynamics with regards to the number of weeds present and the growth of weeds? And also, how do the cover crops influence different dry bean parameters such as population, base to maturity yield, and then the final nitrogen content of the grain? So in order to look at these questions uh, in detail, we first started out choosing three cover crops that we were interested in and the no cover crop treatment. So we decided to look at medium red clover and we used the variety Marathon. We also looked at oilseed radish and used the brand Groundhog. And we looked at rye, which is probably the most common cover crop currently grown before organic dry beans. And we used the variety Wheeler. And then, as I mentioned, we also had a no cover crop uh, treatment for comparison, and there were, was some weed growth in, in that area. So then to understand the planting scheme, uh, this is really a two-year effort. In year one, that's when we're establishing the cover crop. And in year two, that's when we come in and plant our dry beans. So this diagram here is showing how that worked. Now, a typical rotation or a more typical rotation in Michigan would probably be to have corn grown before dry beans. 
but in order to maximize the window of opportunity for incorporating or including cover crops, we decided to follow a small grain such as wheat, which is harvested in July in Michigan. Um, and so this shows how these cover crops, cro cover crops excuse me, were fitting in. So with regard to the clover, we were able to frost seed that into the wheat or the oats that we were growing in usually about March or April. And we allowed that to grow until, uh, until the wheat or small grain was harvested in July. It continued to grow after that all the way up until about two weeks before dry bean planting, at which time we would incorporate it using a chisel plow. For the radish, uh, we planted that after the small grain harvest, and the optimum time for planting that would be in August here in Michigan, and that allows us to really get some of the vigorous uh, shoot and root growth of the radish before it winter kills, because radish does not survive a typical Michigan winter. Uh, planting the radish earlier than August uh, runs the risk of having some seed production, so that's why we targeted that August time frame. Then, as I mentioned, rye is currently the most common cover crop used before beans, and that's because it can be planted so late into the season. And so if you did have corn, uh, following corn harvest, you are still able, in most cases, to plant rye. So following the small green, we planted our rye in about mid-September, allowed that to grow uh, or over winter, grow in the spring, and we targeted its incorporation date at about 18 inches in height. Uh, that happened some of the time, but it just depends on the uh, spring here. If it got wet, occasionally we had rye that reached up to 50 inches in height, which was not our target. Um, and then, of course, we had the no cover uh, treatment with nothing planted in it. So all of these cover crop treatments and the no cover were all uh, tilled in the springtime, even the radish, which had winter killed, and the no cover. And then we um, soil finished them the same prior to planting so that there wouldn't be large differences in the soil handling. In addition to looking at these cover crop treatments, we also wanted to look at a few different dry bean varieties. Now, black beans are currently the most common class of organic dry beans grown in Michigan, so we chose to look at Zorro and black velvet varieties. Uh, we also were interested in the more historical class of navy, so we looked at Vista, and we also looked at those non-nodulating beans, the R99, and this we wanted to include because it would allow us to really look at how cover crop influenced the beans in the absence of nitrogen fixation. So in order to look at these cover crops and these bean varieties, we had two different uh, research type locations. We had sites that were uh, on MSU property where we were really able to um, manage them, get everything planted in a very timely manner. And so at these sites where we had ultimate control over everything, we included all of the cover crop treatments that I just mentioned and all four of the bean varieties as well. We also wanted to do this on grower sites. And so uh, we worked with uh, local organic growers in Michigan who already have experience growing dry beans, and we allowed them to choose one of the cover crops. So they could choose clover, radish, or rye based on their interest or their system. And we compared that to no cover uh, on their farms. We also uh, minimized the number of varieties that we looked at. We looked at one black bean variety, Zorro, and then the one navy bean variety, Vista. So for the MSU sites, I didn't mention, we had two of those per year for three years. So we had six site years there. For the on-farm sites, we had up to nine sites per year for the three years, which ended up totaling 17 site years. So now I wanted to show a diagram of the timing of our measurements that we're taking. Remember, we're going to look at nitrogen, we're going to look at weeds and different driving parameters. So before the, the driving planting even starts, we want to look at peak cover crop biomass. So when that cover crop ha is at its largest, we went out and collected plants both the shoot and the root, and we dried them down and weighed them so that we could compare across sites in years whether one site had, you know, 5,000 pounds per acre of a certain cover crop or it only had 3,000, because you thought that might be important later. So to measure peak cover crop biomass for the radish, we needed to measure it before winter kill. So we would go out and collect plants in November. For rye, our peak biomass um, timing was at the time of incorporation, which I mentioned 
was usually around one month before planting at that 18 inch target height. And then for clover, that was also peak biomass at the time of incorporation, which was two weeks before planting. The rest of the measurements, like I said, looking at nitrogen and weeds and so on, were uh, timed based on the bean growing stage. So we had some of the measurements being taken at the time of planting, which was about mid-June. We had some that were taken uh, when the bean reached the second trifoliate stage, which we also call V2, and this was in early July. We also looked at the time of first flower, or R1, and this was usually late, to, late July to early August. Then the first full pod length, R5, and that was late August to early September. And then we took our final measurements at the time of harvest, which occurred sometime during October. So to begin looking at results, first we'll focus on nitrogen. Uh, before we get quite to the nitrogen, though, I wanted to show you the range of values for biomass production for the cover crops. So these two graphs are showing the difference between the MSU cover crop biomass over three years on the left and the on-farm cover crop biomass on the right. And these uh, what we call box and whisker plots here with the rectangles. The rectangle shows where 50% of the data lied. So the skinnier the rectangle, the uh, less variable the cover crop was from year to year. And then the midline here is really showing you the median, which is not the average, but it's sort of the middle point in the data. And what I want you to get from this slide is that you see that overall we were able to obtain a much greater amount of biomass at the MSU research locations than we were in the on-farm trials. And this is really due to that timeline. At MSU, we could really meet that timeline. And the on-farm sites, they weren't always following a small grain um, or that kind of thing. And so they usually got their cover crops planted a little bit later. And these differences in biomass are significant as we go throughout the rest of the study. So now, <clears throat> looking at the cover crop nitrogen content, so we took those dried cover crops and we ground them up and we analyzed them to see how much nitrogen is actually in the cover crop. And as you can see at both the MSU site and the on-farm site, our clover cover crop, that nitrogen fixing legume, has the most nitrogen content. So that makes sense. And the other cover crops, they do possess nitrogen that they have scavenged, but not, not as much compared to the clover. And then I have a little asterisk here at the bottom that says when you're thinking about this and you see that this median value for clover is 140 pounds of nitrogen per acre, it's important to remember that that doesn't mean it's available immediately at the time of planting. It may be available throughout the course of the season or it may be available throughout uh, several, several seasons following that cover crop. Okay, so we looked at the cover crops and the nitrogen in the cover crops. Now we're looking at the soil and what nitrogen was actually available in the soil. And here we're really focusing on nitrate. And so we see that the uh, clover cover crop, which so far has had higher or has had a decent amount of biomass, has had higher nitrogen in its tissue, did uh, result in, in higher nitrate levels at the time of planting when we saw about 50 five to 20 pounds of nitrogen per acre more than when we compared it to the no cover crop treatment. That was also true and, and with a wider range of values at that V2 or that second trifoliate uh, stage. And then when we move out further, when we're looking at from the time of flowering to the time of harvest, there was about 50% of the time we did see more nitrogen following that clover cover crop. Now moving on to a non-legume, the radish, it was very interesting for us to notice that at the V2 stage, we did see that there was an increase in nitrogen available to beans following radish compared to no clover. It was smaller though, ranging from about 10 to 15 pounds of nitrogen per acre, and this only occurred about half the time. So it didn't happen as regularly, but it was still a surprise that, that this plant, which is only scavenging nitrogen that's already there, was still benefiting the beans at that point in time. Moving on to rye, it's a really different story here. We saw that there was a risk of the rye reducing the amount of nitrogen available compared to no cover crop by a range of 15 to 20 pounds 
of nitrogen per acre. So this is actually uh, almost the exact opposite of clover, although it only happens 50% of the time. And it was associated more so when you are not able to control the rye at the 18 inch height. Uh, we did see a few differences from flowering to harvest with regard to reducing nitrate, but it was less likely. So in the on-farm sites, we occasionally saw that their results mirrored these of the MSU locations, but because this seemed to be biomass dependent, it was less likely because remember they had less biomass. So now moving on to look at the weed dynamics. So we moved from nitrogen to weeds and See if it comes. And uh, I think it was not really a large surprise, but weeds like nitrogen too. So in the clover plots where we had an increased amount of nitrate available, we saw that about 42% of the time this increased the number of weeds compared to no cover in the clover plots. And we saw that it increased the weed biomass or the weed weight about a third of the time. When we looked at radish and rye, it was very rare that we saw differences between those two cover crops and no cover with regards to weed dynamics. And when we looked on farm, where we had lower cover crop biomass, we did not see at any of our measurement times differences between these two weed um, parameters. Also because we were looking at bean variety, we decided to see if there were any differences with regard to just the bean variety when it came to weeds. And there were rarely any differences. And this was kind of expected because the navy beans and the black beans really do look fairly similar in the field. So we wouldn't expect big shading differences or things that might impact weeds. So now moving from nitrogen to weeds onto the dry bean properties themselves. First, we're looking at the dry bean population. So the number of plants that are out there growing in the field. And occasionally we saw at the MSU locations that uh, radish and rye had an influence. So sometimes following oilseed radish, we would see an increase or, or a higher number of uh, dry beans growing than the no cover. And we suspect that this may be related to soil tilth, but we didn't really have any measurements to back up that suspicion at this point. Uh, we also saw that in one instance in 2012 when we had a very dry year and our rye cover crop did get quite large, uh, it actually kept some of the moisture in the soil and that increased soil moisture at the time of planting resulted in more uniform emergence of the dry beans. So in that one instance, with regard to population, rye seemed to be somewhat beneficial. Um, when we looked at the on-farm sites, we rarely saw differences when it came to cover crop with regard to dry bean populations. Uh, in one year, though, we did see that rye reduced uh, dry bean populations, and that was more of a management issue. The beans were planted too close to the time of rye incorporation, and so that residue didn't have time to dry down and decay uh, like it would during a two-week interval, and that really allowed a seed corn maggot, which likes that decaying material, uh, it was there and able to feed on the beans, and so it resulted in large gaps in the rows between plants because of that seed corn maggot feeding. And uh, this this uh, table that we have on the right is just showing an average over the three years of the MSU locations. I point out that the, our planting rate was quite a bit higher than this. It was ranged from 106 to 120 seeds per acre. And we wanted to plant fairly high rate because we know that the mechanical weed control measures like rotary hoeing do reduce the dry bean populations. Now looking and comparing across the varieties, we were kind of looking at black beans versus navy beans here. We found, and it was very obvious when you're out there looking in the field, that the black bean populations were greater than those of the navy beans. But this was true 100% of the time at the MSU locations and about half the time at the on-farm locations. There's something about the black beans, that appears, that makes them more vigorous and able to uniformly emerge in these type of conditions. So now we wanted to look at uh, sort of the nitrogen fixation, which Jim talked about, and we looked at it from sort of a, a more simplistic approach, I guess you would say. We wanted to look at nodulation. So we actually decided to count nodules on the beans and compare across our different treatments. And what we found was that at the time of flowering, when we dug up the root, we saw that there were uh, less nodules found on the beans that were following clover. 
And it has been well documented that uh, increased soil nitrogen availability does reduce the driving's dependence on these um, symbioses with the bacteria. And so uh, this really supported our nitrogen story that we've seen thus, for, thus far. When we compared across the driving varieties, we did notice one difference at that second trifoliate stage where we, we happened to see more nodules on the black velvet beans than we did across our other beans. And of course, our R99 beans had no nodules. So originally we had not intended to measure driving maturity, but we did notice some differences in the first year. And so we evaluated it at the MSU locations. Uh, here, I'm only going to talk about cover crop uh, differences, but we decided to go out and visually rate the fields when it got closer to the time for harvest. We saw about a quarter percent of the time, or excuse me, 25 percent of the time that beans planted following rye seem to mature faster. So these two pictures here are both showing you that non-nodulating R99 bean. And on the left, it was following rye. And on the right, it was no cover. And you can see that the no cover plants uh, are still green. They still have a few more leaves on them. So something about the rye, perhaps the nitrogen, seemed to be stressing the beans out and causing them to mature early. So we have two parameters left to look at. The first one is yield, uh, comparing among the cover crops. And we saw that occasionally a cover crop was responsible for some sort of reduction in yield. And in MSU, um, we only saw that it was statistically significant in one of our six set years. And that was where um, we did see that rye, uh, which remember had tied up nitrogen, did end up reducing dry bean yield. And when we looked at the on-farm sites, we saw this at two of 17 years, but it wasn't uh, necessarily due to nitrogen levels. It was more to do with the seed corn maggot feeding that we talked about earlier. Uh, now looking at variety and how that impacted yield, we saw that that non-nodulating R99 bean yielded the lowest of our three varieties 100% of the time at the MSU locations. And that's really showing us the benefit of uh, nitrogen fixation. And then when we looked at black bean versus navy bean, so this is both MSU and on-farm, we saw that the Zorro uh, black beans yielded greater than the Vistas about 20% of the time. But if you remember, the populations that we talked about were higher in the navy, or excuse me, in the black beans 100 or 50% of the time. So those navy beans, though there were fewer of them out there, most of the time were able to compensate for that reduced population when it came down to yield. So our final th parameter that we looked at was the nitrogen content of the beans. We are still w chasing this nitrogen from the clover, and we saw that it increased the number of weeds, but it really didn't improve dry bean yield. So where did the beans benefit from the nitrogen at all? So when we looked at the actual seed, we saw that when we frost seeded clover and had a high biomass, that um, we observed about a 30% increase in the bean nitrogen content. And that translates into higher protein content for those beans also. Uh, we didn't see this in 2011. Um, we were not able to frost seed in that year. So it will be interesting to see once we get our 2013 results if this relationship holds true, if that high clover biomass resulted in a higher percent nitrogen in the beans at the end of the season. Then when we looked at this um, and we compared across varieties, we saw that in 2011, again, there weren't differences. But in 2012, we saw that the black velvet variety did have a higher nitrogen content on the grain than the Zorro. And again, we're still waiting to see if these results hold true for um, another year in 2013. So now to get to a couple or a few conclusion slides looking at bean variety and cover crop. Uh, this slide basically gives you on the left all the parameters that I just talked about for the different dry bean varieties and how we compared them. I didn't really mention uh, maturity here. That's something that is fairly well known when a dry bean variety is released. They usually know the average uh, days until harvest. So we didn't talk about that here, but I did include it. So the green boxes, or excuse me, at the top we have our different varieties. 
the black beans on the left, and the navy beans here on the right. And when we're looking at these different parameters, a green box means that it was good. And a red box means that it may have had some issues. So you really see here, when looking across the parameters that we measured, they are much more green um, when you look at black beans versus navy beans. And so, and, and that's really uh, is a good thing. I mean, black beans are in demand in the market now, and um, so growers are, are having a decent time growing them. And there may be some room for improvement with the navy beans with regard to organic production. Now summarizing uh, the differences among cover crops. Again, I have the sort of the parameters that we looked at on the left and the different cover crops that we looked at across the top. And these are all comparisons to the no cover crop treatment. And again, green boxes are good things, red boxes are potentially negative things. So with clover, you know, we saw that it increased available nitrogen, but that resulted in higher weeds some of the time, maybe decreased bean nodulation, which may or may not be detrimental, and sometimes could result in increased um, bean nitrogen content. When we look at radish, a lot of the things are neutral color, which means it really wasn't different from the no cover crop treatment. So that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, some other observations, though, that we had with regard to radish was that it might be difficult to fit into a rotation depending on, you know, what your prior crop is. Can you get it in early enough to make it worth it? But if you can, there may be some benefits when it comes to spring management. It really requires less management. Um, than the other two that we studied. And then finally, looking at rye, there are really some, some risks associated with rye, and those may be um, tying up of nitrogen, uh, decreasing bean yield. We only saw that occasionally, but it did happen, and um, also decreasing the time to maturity. And this potential for seed corn maggot, that really could be an issue with rye or clover if you don't leave enough time between incorporation and planting. So I mentioned that there are some risks, but how can we increase our success with these cover crops, I think is the real message. Uh, when you're looking at clover, I think it's important if you have a really good stand of clover, you have a really lush, beautiful looking clover field, you may want to think about terminating that greater than two weeks before planting so that you don't have some of these nitrogen associated issues with regards to weeds. Uh, also something to consider is that clover might be more beneficial before a crop uh, that is a good competitor for nitrogen. So something like corn, which um, may do a better job competing with the weeds for that nitrogen. When we looked at radish, as I just mentioned in the previous slide, uh, it seems to be pretty neutral compared to no cover, so maybe a little bit lower risk, but that planting time is going to be critical to establish a good stand, and so that really would require some plan planting. Um, and then finally with rye, it seems that termination timing is probably the most important thing to consider, both because of issues with seed corn maggot, so the window of time between incorporation and planting, and also with regard to trying to avoid reducing the nitrogen available, you really want to try and control it at 18 inches or less, which may be difficult if you have a wet spring. So with that, uh, I think I'm done with my portion, and we have time for, time for questions, and I'll turn it back over to Alice. Thank you um, very much, Erin and Jim. So, um, combining beans, how do you prevent the beans uh, from splitting? Any combining recommendations? Are splits marketable? Do you have any comments on that, Erin or Jim? Well, I, I think when you're combining, it's extremely important to be paying attention to the moisture content of the seed. Drier seed is going to be more likely to split during the combining process uh, versus the, with a little higher moisture. Um, so sometimes you might only be able to combine earlier in the day before the dew has dried off and, you know, by afternoon stop for the day so you don't damage the quality. Um, splits are important for quality. Um, uh, some beans that might be going into things like Refried beans might not be so important, you know, for pintos, but it's definitely um, something you would need to watch out for and try to prevent as much as you can. Okay, great. I would say, uh, this is Erin, um, I would say that uh, we are usually targeting at 18% moisture, and that's what all of our yields are adjusted to also. Okay. Um, do you have any recommendation um, 
of cover crops based on seed variety and soil composition. Um, so the NPK content of the soil. Let's see, it's kind of a... Well, I suppose that's a, a fairly broad question and usually we're really looking to add nitrogen to the system, right? I don't know that there are soils that are have nitrogen in abundance. So if that's something that you're looking for, especially in organic production, then definitely considering the legume and if you could get that to fit your system would be important. Um, there is a resource to kind of play around with different cover crops that might work for your system. Um, and that would be on the Midwest Cover Crop Council website, and that's M and 3 C's, so mccc.msu.edu. There's actually a selector tool. Right now it's more targeted for states in the Midwest, but you could play around with it nonetheless, and you can um, select some of the attributes that you would like to get from your cover crops, and uh, adding nitrogen would be one of those. So you might find some uh, more specific suggestions there. If you are in the Midwest, it actually adjust, nicely adjusts for your uh, frost dates and um, you can also put in the crop that you're planting um, to see what uh, cover crops might work for you and it also provides you with a fact sheet. So without knowing more information, I would say that would be a good place to start. Okay, great. Um, can you talk about how um, your clover was terminated and incorporated? Okay, so for the clover, uh, we actually um, terminated it using a chisel plow, and I don't think any of my growers maybe one time used a moldboard plow, but that seemed to be very rare. So they were usually using a uh, chisel plow. At the MSU locations where we had a lot of biomass, we would sometimes have to chisel plow more than once in opposite directions. And so that is probably another detriment to letting your clover get too large. So uh, that's really all we did. We chisel plowed it, then we would let it um, sort of mellow for a little while before we came across with a soil finisher to kind of do the final uh, preparations before planting. Okay, um, can, I know you touched on this, but can you explain the difference between N14 and N15 again? Um, yeah, um, N14 and N15 are both naturally occurring versions, types of nitrogen in the atmosphere. Um, you probably, you know, there's different it's they're stable they're not radioactive so don't don't think down that route but they they're they're na they're na they're natural they're naturally occurring and they they're fairly consistent proportion to each other on the planet so the N15 is just different by having an extra proton or neutron excuse me added to it so it's a little bit heavier and that's essentially the only difference between the two um, between the two isotopes um, and so we can you know, like I, I mentioned, the, the microbes tend to have a little greater affinity. So in their biology, they just hold on to, absorb and hold on to that N15 a little better. And that results in a little increase of the N15 in the soil as compared to the atmosphere. Okay. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Um, are there any, um, were there any other ways that you terminated any of the other cover crops? Um, that is pretty much what we used. Uh, there were a couple occasions where um, our rye got very tall that we actually had to mow in order to get it to stop growing because it was too wet to use a chisel plow. So we did occasionally do that to try and stop it from growing and then we went in and chisel plowed as soon as the soil was dry enough. Um, I think that's something that we're interested in looking at in the future as I see that you almost need a decision tree uh, to, to decide, especially with regard to rye, what you're going to do if it's dry, if it's really dry, or if it's a really wet year, or if you planted late. And so um, that's a direction we'd like to work on in the future is uh, what do you do in some of these sort of extreme situations to best manage the rye, especially if you're worried about tying up nitrogen or some of your other um, issues. So we, we use the chisel plow, but that's something that we want to look at in the future. Okay. Um, did you use any kind of seed treatments? Um, I guess I'll answer that first. Uh, with regard to the cover crops, um, we bought the clover seed was organic, and it was treated with an organic inoculant from uh, Albert Lee. 
And so uh, with the regard to the cover crops, that was the only one that was treated. Uh, we did have a little bit of an issue the third year trying to get untreated uh, radish seed, but we were able to get with the seed source and get untreated groundhog seed. Um, so that's the cover crop story. And then with regards to the dry beans, none of our dry beans were treated. Um, you know, conventionally they may have a fungicide treatment, but ours were all non-treated um, beans. And then Jim may have some comments. Oh, we did, or I guess I'll open up the subject for him a little bit. Um, if you're going into an area that hasn't had a history of dry beans before, it may be important to inoculate with that rhizobium if you don't think it's naturally occurring. And so the first year of this project, there was an OMRI approved product for dry bean inoculation. Um, and that was removed from the OMRI approval list for the second and third years of the study. So we ended up creating our own. Um, and we had that all approved uh, with the certifiers so that that was all, all fine. But that is kind of a concern at this point in time that there's not a um, already available product for organic dry beans to use as an inoculum. And then maybe Jim can add some comments to that. Well, I think that's a really good important point, uh, Aaron, is that if you buy an inoculant that's for soybeans, and I actually in the past have dealt with a certifier that recommended using a soybean inoculant in dry beans, it won't work. They're different organisms and dry beans do not associate with the same organisms that soybeans associate with, so it would, it would be a waste. Um, we did treat our seed with the, the uh, in-house if you will, um, rhizobio product to the seed before planting. Um, and again, we had, you know, investigated that and received the permissions necessary, but it's, um, and, and it's unfortunate that there is not one approved at the moment because it may be necessary. Although if the area has had a history of dry beans, um, dry beans are considered promiscuous nodulators and that means they will fix, they will form associations with quite a wide variety of rhizobia, but not all rhizobia are created equal either. So it might be important if there's no history to, to investigate further into getting an inoculant that will help out. Okay, um, we have a questioner who's interested in if whether you have any pictures of your harvest equipment. Um, they would be interested in seeing them. Do you, does your website have, does, does your project have a website or anywhere where you might post pictures like that or can they contact you? Um, there are actually a couple pictures, though they're small, in the presentation. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if we, if you want to go back through that. Um, I can show you, I think, okay. I a couple of well, my well, yields. Well, the PDF is available. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it's very preferred. small. Yeah, uh, but, they're small. Okay. Do you have a website um, for your project at all, or is there somewhere online that people can find out more? Um, with regard to the cover crop portion, um, we have posted some of our information at, uh, on our weed science site because I, I primarily work in weed science and that site is msuweeds.com and there's actually an organic tab that I've worked on creating and trying to fill out a little bit and there will be more um, in the months to come as we finish analyzing the data for this. I can't think though that there are any specific pictures on there of our harvest equipment. And um, as I mentioned in the intro, it's, it's really um, most common at this point in time for growers to be direct harvesting uh, their beans, so with a combine, just a one-pass harvest operation. But for our smaller scale research, we were actually pulling beans and putting them through a stationary Almeco thresher. So it was a little bit different than what the growers do just given the scale um, of things and there is a picture of that um, small, it's, a, it's on a trailer, a uh, thresher on one of those yield slides in the top right corner. So, so that's what I have for now. Um, I'll keep that in mind as I'm expanding the organic portion of our uh, tab on the weed science page that maybe that's something of interest to, to post. Okay, um, that's great. Um, okay, we had a couple people asking whether you've ever used multiple um, cover crops together and evaluate the combination? Um, I, I know that, that is a qu that's a question that I get a lot and um, that is something that we are interested in doing at the f in the future and I know Alice you mentioned there's an upcoming webinar looking at mixes. For this uh, particular project we wanted to start with monocultures and look at the differences among the cover crops 
at that level before we take it to looking at mixtures. So that would be one of the next stages. And we're also really interested in investigating sort of how these cover crops compete with each other in these types of mixes. So um, it, it's sort of in the next step, but it wasn't something that um, we decided to take on. Uh, at this point in time, we wanted to look at a single species and then move on from there. Um, okay. Um, are other beans like pinto beans um, comparable to black beans in their characteristics, or would they be closer to navy beans? Um, this, this is Jim. I'll, t I'll take that one. I think the the, the pinto beans. I guess their their complementary white version would be the navy bean, or I'm sorry, the Great Northern, not the navy bean. Great Northern beans, which are both they're both medium sized seed, sized uh, bean seed classes. Um, pinto beans would be more in line with black beans as far as the, the perhaps benefits compared to the white version. Um, we do have varieties of pinto beans that are upright and are harvestable, you know, through the direct cut method. Uh, more uh, older pinto varieties are more viney where they have to be pulled. So the, um, yes, in, in many ways, pintos would be comparable to black beans for production purposes. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, there are some people asking whether you've had any experiences with other cover crops, for example, um, lentils or buckwheat. Um, I have, I have not had any experience personally with lentils. Um, I have had, I grew buckwheat only one time, and that was sort of to get the field ready when I was transitioning one of these fields for organic production. So I am probably not the best person to ask questions to about those two cover crops. Again, um, I would defer back to that Midwest Cover Crop Council page. There are There is information about those cover crops there. There is also a listserv available on that site. And again, uh, that was just on the screen. It's mccc.msu.edu. And on that listserv, if people have particular questions about cover crops, um, it, the listserv has people from academia, industry, and farmers, and currently has about 350 people. So we regularly get questions on there with regards to um, different cover crops, production practices in particular areas. And usually if you ask a question on the listserv, you'll get, you know, three to ten responses within a day. Wow. So okay. if you have questions specific about cover crops, I would really suggest joining that listserv um, and you may pick up some good information that way. Okay, yeah, that sounds like a great resource. Um, let's see, at what stage did you use the rotary hoe to control weeds, and how much damage did you see to the beans? Okay, so that's a good question. Um, our original goal was to use what's called a tined weeder before uh, the beans emerged, but uh, in that mid-June time period, beans come up out of the ground very quickly, sometimes in less than four days. So using a tined weeder, um, was not always possible because that can cause damage once the beans have started to emerge. So uh, we did rely on the rotary hoe a lot and we um, would use that up until that second trifoliate stage, that V2 stage, because after that, that's when we started noticing a, a lot more damage. You actually see beans on the ground um, when using the rotary hoe. And we had done some research previously looking at so it's really like a three-week time period that you have to use the rotary hoe from the time of planting until uh, that V2 stage. And we looked at comparing um, different timings of rotary hoeing, whether it be once a week or based on, uh, on the weather using growing degree days. And so we rotary hoed between two and four times during that four-week period with those different treatments. And so we found that actually the... Um, the one that was using a larger set of growing degree days, which resulted in two rotary hoeings during that three weeks, really did the same job uh, as maybe three rotary hoeings or four and reduced our bean losses. So uh, we have had some experience doing that. And then after V2, that's when we switch to cultivating between the rows and it sort of builds the soil up at the base of the bean plants. Um, so I hope that that answers the question. You do get some beans that are pulled out. It's not always obvious that it's happening. Um, sometimes you can adjust your speed based on the soil conditions and that kind of thing to, to try and minimize your, your losses. And I would say our uh, average rotary hoeing speed, we had a single rotary hoe on, on the campus sites, was usually about 10 to 11 miles per hour. So pretty fast for uh, 
field activity. Okay. Um, how far from release are those bean lines that showed better BNF, especially the um, black bean cultivars? Um, that really depends. Those are currently um, going through the, the variety trials, the sta what we call the standard trials. Uh, several of them have been chosen and grown, and and of course they have to. You know, those individual varieties may never actually be released, but they will certainly be used for uh, breeding purposes to to create new lines. So I, I can't really give a good answer on that. Um, it, it would probably if it takes many, many years to develop a variety and make sure that it's good enough for release and trying trying it over, you know, giving it a trials over a broad area. So it's kind of difficult to give a good answer to, to that question right now. But they're definitely, you know, we've noticed them and we're working with them further. So hopefully in the future they will be either available or help improve uh, lines of the future, new new varieties. Okay. Um, was, weed, was weed growth assessed during the cover crop at all? Um, no, I it was not directly assessed in like a, a counting of the number of weeds um, type manner. <clears throat> Excuse me. We did when we collected the cover crop biomass. We did divide that biomass into the biomass of the weeds and the biomass of the cover crops. And so we do have that information. I didn't present it today. So in that way, we did look at um, weed biomass at that peak uh, cover crop biomass production time. And, and our most common weed issues probably were like in the clovers. Occasionally we would have some annual grasses that would come in in the fall uh, after the uh, small grain had been harvested. harvested. And, um, and occasionally sometimes the small grain would come back as a volunteer crop within the cover crop. So those were probably like two of the most common weeds. In the rye and the radish, uh, we seem to have pretty good stands with those overall, really good coverage, and so not as much weed biomass, I would say, in those two cover crop uh, treatments. Okay, um, so you said that um, rye is more common as a cover crop um, than clover, but would you um, recommend planting a cover crop of clover and then harvesting it at least two weeks before the bean variety seed that you want to grow? Um, I think if you could figure out a way to put it in um, and then control it early that it would be fine. I mean we did see that it didn't reduce yield compared to no cover, but I think you just really have to be conscious of can you fit fit it into your rotation the previous year and uh, how is it doing in the spring. I mean we had at least uh, one or two on-farm sites with clover each year and we didn't really see these issues with weeds and things because they had lower biomass. So I think that it can be done. It's just something you need to be more conscious of uh, the risks that might be associated with it. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, is supplemental nitrogen ever added in organic driving systems prior to or at planting like manure or poultry litter to match that conventional way of adding 40 pounds of nitrogen per acre? I think that's a great question and I didn't mention that. So in my study where I wanted to really tease apart nitrogen results, I asked the growers not to put on any nitrogen sources in the plot areas. But it seems to be fairly common for them to be using some kind of uh, dried chicken manure or composted chicken manure um, if they can get their hands on it. Um, and uh, usually those piles show up during the later summer and so I think some of that gets applied in the fall. And then some of them also use compost. So I don't know the exact rates that they always use. I, I do have that information from them. I don't know it off the top of my head. But they are putting um, some sources of nitrogen or uh, other external um, things on there such as compost and manure. Okay, um, let's see. Um, did um, the cover crop choice influence disease pressure? I know you um, mentioned that maggot, but um, in any other way did it? So that was something that when we wrote this grant we were interested in looking at and we really didn't have a lot of disease issues throughout the three years of the study in any of my locations. So it's really hard to say um, whether it would be beneficial or detrimental to particular diseases. You almost have to actually like inoculate the field to 
to really assess that. So we didn't see any issues. Um, I know, you know, well, I would want to look further into planting a legume cover crop and following with a legume um, cash crop to see if that would uh, make it any more susceptible to particular diseases, but we did not see that during these three years. Okay, um, let's see. Um, have you done any study of um, cover crops using no-till methods? I know that's going to um, be mentioned in next week's, in, no, on April 8th webinar too. I just wanted to throw yeah, in that. Yeah, so that but, would yeah. be a great time to tune in to learn more about that. I know at one of our um, uh, research stations here, the Kellogg Biological uh, Research Station, we had an extension specialist, Dale Much, who did do some work on, on the roller crimper for terminating rye. Um, and in Michigan, we, we haven't achieved um, results that are very consistent. And so it will be interesting to hear what they present in early April. I think there are other areas where they have had better luck with it, and maybe there are things that we could tweak in Michigan to make it work better. But personally, I haven't um, worked on cover crops for organic production in, in a no-till situation. Okay. Um, let's see. We have time for a couple more questions. Um, yeah. How much closer are the beans planted when using mechanical cultivation? I, I'm not sure if they're meaning row spacing or the spacing in the row, but uh, for most of our sites, uh, we the organic growers were using 30-inch rows. There were a couple that had switched either at the beginning or throughout the course of this study over to 22-inch uh, rows, but that required them changing all of their equipment um, for for mechanically weeding their beans, their corn, their everything. So if they were changing the 22 inch rows for beans, they were doing it for corn and their other crops as well. So I think that is what they're asking. Um, I think growers are moving to a somewhat tighter row spacing um, could be beneficial from a weed standpoint because as the canopy closes and shades the bare soil, uh, it can reduce some of your weed emergence. So that may be part of their motivation for decreasing their row width. But I did not come into contact with any organic growers who are growing their beans in 15-inch rows. Um, we just got a comment that said, um, here in the Maritimes, we use extra wide row spacing to reduce disease in our humid autumns. Um, and I guess she was wondering if you had any experience with that. Um, I don't have any experience with okay. that, sorry. Oh, yeah. and, and the other... Um, the, the questioner who asked about the um, spacing um, said that um, she asked this because um, she, she she said that it had to do with what you had said about planting closer to make up for losses due to uh, weeding with mechanical cultivation. Oh, okay. I understand. So I, when I meant, I meant increasing the seeding rate. So uh, and a conventional grower would, would uh, plant even, you know, even in 30 inch rows at 106 seeds per acre. And we tried to bump that up and, and lean more towards this 120, or excuse me, 120,000 seeds per acre rate because we knew that there would be at least some percentage of reduction due to the mechanical weeding. And, and the rotary hoe runs right over the rows. So, it, I mean, that's how it kind of takes out the plants. So it would be doing that regardless of how close your rows are together or far apart. But yeah, there I was talking about the seeding rate and trying to err on the higher side to make sure we maintained a, a good population. But the, the beans, you know, like we saw with the navies, even when their population is reduced a little bit, they really are able to compensate by each plant having more space and is able to produce more beans per plant when they're a little bit further apart. Okay. Um, Aaron, do you expect changes in weed pressure after cover crops over a longer term? Um, I definitely think you would see probably a shift in the species that you have. And I've seen this in other cover crop work that I've done where you may um, may not have uh, quack grass or something anymore after you've been planting hairy vetch, but, but that allows room for something else to come in. So uh, I think that you definitely over a long term would probably see a shift in the um, species composition that you have. And, I mean, hopefully you would see a reduction in the number if you're able to, you know, keep seed, weed seed production down and those kinds of things. But, um, yeah, I would, 
I, I would definitely expect a change in the species composition. Okay, and um, finally, um, do you know if there are any genetically engineered beans on the market yet? In the United States, there are no genetically engineered dry beans. It's they're very difficult. Uh, you know, researchers, and other people have looked at at transforming them. You know, making them GMOs, but it, they've been very. The plant itself is resistant to genetic transformation. So, no, in the United States, there are there are no varieties that are GMOs. Okay, thank you. Um, we're pretty much running out of time now, um, but I would really like to thank everyone for your questions and mention once again that you can find um, this and um, many other upcoming and archived webinars on organic farming and research topics at the link on your screen. Um, we did another webinar on dry beans earlier this spring and there's quite a few cover crop webinars in our archive. Thank you so much um, Aaron and Jim for um, presenting this webinar today and uh, thanks to everyone for joining us.